to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Paulus. He is currently working as professor in the Department of Physics, IIT Guwahati, Assam. He is going to talk on the topic Mysteries of the Cosmos, Story of Dark Matter. So, we will talk about the dark matter. Okay. So, I welcome all the participants, those who are coming from outside also, and youngest participant also. <laughs> So before uh, we move forward, let me briefly tell you about his academic journey so far. He did his PhD, Dr. Paulus did his PhD from PRL Ahmedabad Physical Research Laboratory. After that, he worked as postdoctoral fellow in TFR Mumbai and then in DD Institute of Sciences, Bangalore. He also worked in Germany as Humboldt fellow and UK as Marie Curie fellow. He joined IIT Guwahati in 2004 and serving the institute in various capacities like he was actually also etc regarding his research career so far he has 44 publications to his credit with 1250 citations his, his current research in, interests are in the field of cosmology particle physics and collider physics so my advice to the students who are interested in particle physics from my own experience he is a very approachable person okay all kind of a person so you, you should be in touch with Okay, so I welcome all the participants, sir. Okay, thank you, Sumit. Thank you, those of you for. Uh, um, inviting me and uh, all the arrangements, and thank you all for coming down. So I'm very happy to be here. I had come briefly earlier, but uh, that was a very big one-day trip. But the same, I'm here for a couple of days and uh, interacted with some of you and others. Uh, we will interact. So let's uh, <clears throat> get into today's discussion. Uh, uh, basically. We will talk about the uh, some aspects of dark matter, which I will, which is a broad topic now, where people have been working on it for um, some decades. So I'll not really be covering all aspects of it, but we'll be focusing on what I know, which is the particle physics point of view of uh, dark matter energies. So what I am planning to do is to actually give a bit of a broad. Uh, introduction of the particle physics itself so relevant to what we have to be, what uh, the cosmological particle uh, uh, relevance of the particle physics in the early universe will be clear on the when we actually know what particle physics is in a little bit uh, uh, at a certain level. So that I will do uh, first and then we will talk about uh, the that matter and what that so let's work up, uh, get on with it. Um, let's see, the last decade was very interesting, in fact, uh, specifically from the point of view of particle physics and cosmology and gravity. We had three important uh, discoveries. This is uh, in 2019 that we had the first direct glimpse of uh, the black hole. And this was the first ever direct photography of the black hole. We had to wait so far, uh, so long because of the scale that they could get this at that precision. The precision probability was not awaited. That was only recent. It was not that it was not there. We had very much of indirect evidence for that and black holes before that. But anyway, that is not really the topic of our discussion. But it's uh, it's it's one of the interesting objects in the cosmos. One of the very interesting objects in the cosmos and a lot of research is going on in that one. And that's also confirming the, reconfirming the general relativity. And this is, this was a few years earlier to that, uh, that first ever detection of gravitational waves. So, so far, uh, whatever we know about um, the universe is through the electromagnetic waves, electromagnetic uh, um, uh, spectrum that we receive to either uh, optical range telescopes or radio wave telescopes or um, uh, the whole range of this electromagnetic spectrum. So that was our uh, kind of uh, uh, tool to observe the universe. 
and Einstein, unlike the Newtonian gravity, Einstein's general theory of relativity says that the space-time fabric itself is an actor in the gravitational interaction, and therefore the repercussions of anything that happens gravitationally at some place can actually propagate to other places, like when you drop a stone in a still water, the surface waves will actually propagate, and then you will see, even if you don't see the stone falling in that, you know that something has happened by just looking at the thing. So this is something like that. That somewhere else, two black holes uh, merge, and some energy is released in that, and that propagates through the space-time fabric, and then our LIGO detector detects it. This was the first ever detection of that. Now they have many, many things which we have seen. And then we had uh, the particle physics is when this was expected, and then we were looking for and waiting for, for I think, three decades or more, four decades, I think, 30 years. And uh, finally, we had uh, confirmed and detected that. There is a fundamental particle, which is a spin zero particle. The normally matter is made of spin half particles like electrons and protons. All matter is made of that. I will come to that a little bit more. Uh, but and then we also have photons and what like photons there are other particles, which are spin one particles. Spin zero particle that's not really their part of any matter or anything that you see in force or any of this thing. They were actually but needed for some other very important reason that for masses of electron, for example, to get the mass of the electron, you need that to interact with the scalar particle, like a, what's called the Higgs particle. So this was also predicted, which was very much needed from the point of view of standard model that. This would be there, and then people were searching for it or um, in different experimental setups. There were alternate approaches saying that it cannot be needed to be there, and other, uh, there could be other ways. But it settled it in 2012 that we do have such a particle, and then that kind of also completed the particle spectrum, elementary particle spectrum that the standard model has told us exists. That makes everything in the universe. Okay. So um, that way uh, we will and, and tell a little bit about more about these things and then also tell what the standard model is not able to explain some of the things. And we'll not go into the details of that, but basically uh, focus on so some aspects of that matter. That's what we will do today during. So and the particle physics uh, works in a kind of a reductionist uh, way. Like we have been saying that we have there are a variety of things, including us, that we see every day, and even other ways when we look at the universe at that. And um, then we know that so for some time that all these things are made from uh, something like hundred uh, plus elements. Okay, but then further on we can actually see in the particle physics uh, framework that um, these uh, molecules and atoms are further made of nucleus, which is made of protons. And you go again uh, searching for what's the, what, what makes the protons, then we know now that protons have substructures, so they are made of what are called quarks, and electrons are there. Electrons do not have any structure. So at the moment, what we know is that quarks are the elementary particles, the fundamental particle, and electrons, and some other, a few other particles which are similar to the electron. And these few particles actually make everything, everything in the universe. And it's a bit surprising if you stop and think a little bit about it, because we have a variety of things and um, everything, everything that we know in the observational universe. Okay, is made of all these a few handful of these particles that we have, and their dynamics. I mean, they are not just uh, particles, just like 
not interacting, but they do interact in various different ways. That is why the structures are formed in like yeah, the complex structures like us also. And uh, the, it's also identified now that we have four fundamental forces, and that's it. And everything, all the dynamics that we know of uh, is decided by these four fundamental forces. And of these two are very familiar to us. We do actually experience that every day. Just now uh, we are talking on the microphone or light is there, everything is there for because of the electricity and various other things. I can lift my something and reflect my cells because of electricity. So electromagnetic interaction or any atomic system is all things, all things three, everything depends on that. Gravitational interaction similarly is very well familiar to all of us. But there are two other forces which are not that obvious. It's there. It's not as obvious because it is not macroscopically seen. Macroscopically, in the sense that at this scale, energy scale, and length scale that we usually perceive. These are relevant at a very small scales at the nuclear scales, nuclear scales and subnuclear scales. So there is a but it is easy to actually see that they are there because, for example, Rutherford also told us that atom has a nucleus which constitutes all, which uh, keeps all the protons, all the different protons, which is like electrically like charged in a small volume of space. And then that's uh, if you don't have any other force to counter the electromagnetic repulsion, then they will fall. Gravity is attractive, but we can easily check that gravity is much, much, much weaker than electromagnetic interaction. And therefore, something has to be much stronger than this, which is simply called the strong nuclear force. So they, that glues the uh, protons together in the nucleus. That's one simple way of understanding that. But that's not the only thing that we know about the nuclear force. We have gone much farther than that and then made a complete mathematical description of the whole thing and then now tested it at various different levels in many different independent experiments. And now we can say that it is clearly established that there is this fundamental force, uh, which is still called you know, strong nuclear force. And there is this weak nuclear force, which again is familiar to us, this process with beta decay and any other radiative decay. And that cannot be explained by electromagnetic field interaction or gravity or strong nuclear force. So we need another force which is there. So um, this I will take a little later, I will come back to it. So I just uh, <coughs> mentioned that beta decay for this case or any other beta decay. Yeah, at the nucleon level can be seen as a neutron going to a proton and an electron and a neutrino. So the neutrino was there because of some energetic reasons. It is a it is a particle, fundamental particle, which is not detected. So it's a missing particle. A missing particle is I mean it was predicted, it was actually suggested by Pauli, and then it is now very important it has a very important role in the particle dynamics and in the beta decay it was there because of the energetic presence and then other reasons and um, you can easily see that this works well with any beta decay that one proton one neutron is converted into a proton uh, so that happened and now another thing i want you to notice here is that uh, new particles can be created so creation of new particles is another thing that we can see, which is again relevant for us today uh, in today's discussion because we are talking about uh, creation of matter in the early universe, okay, and then the evolution of the universe from that. So uh, it's possible that uh, particles which do not do not exist prior to that can be created. That is what happened in beta decay. We know that that is possible. It is there. And this is exactly what happens in other things, like, um, okay, so this is the other part of the story, like uh, these particles in the right yeah? Classically, we think about an electron or any charged particle interacting with each other, as one charged particle would see the electric field of the other particle. So 
uh, in quantum picture, we actually consider this electromagnetic field as collection of small, small particles. Okay, in quantum mechanics, they have both particle and wave properties. That is a kind of a universal thing. It's true for electron, a matter particle, and it is true for electromagnetic field as well, or the photons as well. So they behave like waves and uh, particles. So the particle property of the uh, photon or the electromagnetic field becomes very apparent in many different uh, particle interactions like this thing. Photoelectric effect is one of the things that we are familiar with, pumping effect, uh, scattering, and then various other places. And then, so that's what happens. So we can, in quantum picture, understand the interaction of two charged particles, like uh, exchange of uh, the photons happening through the exchange of the photons. And as I said, we can create particles from um, uh, in the video, okay? Similarly, here, if from radiation also, we can actually create particles. So usually, we have to actually also now introduce the concept of um, antiparticles. So like electron has an antiparticle which is called positron. So every particle has its antiparticle as well. So the particle and antiparticle can annihilate and then become kind of uh, radiation. Of so we can become uh, other type of fields or particle energy forms, radiation or photons. So other way is also possible. Okay, so now uh, this is not specific to electromagnetic interaction. It's also true for other weak interactions, etc. So we can actually think about this, sorry, this um, weak interaction uh, in a diagrammatic way. This as a neutron going to a proton and electron return. But there is a mediator here also. Like you can think about photon as the mediator of electromagnetic interaction. You can think about this W boson as the mediator of the weak interaction. So that kind of was, uh, is uh, the very, very sketchy brief summary of the standard model without going into the details of the interaction. So, so we have these matter particles and uh, which uh, have uh, these quarks and also the leptons. Leptons are like electron, there are a few others, and the neutron, neutrinos. And then we have these mediators, photon and weak bosons, okay, weak uh, mediators, and the strong, the mediator of the strong interactions. This is the Higgs boson that we were talking about, which is needed to generate the mass for this one. So that summarizes the, uh, the spectrum of the standard model in fact. That's it. That makes everything. And uh, everything that we see, we observe. Okay, we will come to the main part of this one, which what is missing here. Okay? So at that at, at this stage, so far so good. And we think everything is successfully uh, explained. It's consistent with a variety of very precise experimental measurement observations in different places, like and in different uh, contexts. And uh, there is no, no contradiction with any of the experiments so far, except the small anomalies, which are still not confirmed, etc. But there are some staring um, uh, uh, difficulties also, which, which we will come to. Uh, so this also can be actually thought about as all the particles, these things are made of these quarks and leptons. So everything is in the universe, we can think about a started from such elementary particles. So that is what the picture that we would have, like coming to the, the <clears throat> okay, so this, this line is missing anyway, this is not very important. So the Big Bang cosmology, Big Bang uh, cosmology is uh, it is kind of a standard cosmology. Now cosmology uh, has become a precise uh, uh, science uh, uh, in the past uh, few or some uh, couple of decades or more than a couple of decades, three, four decades in fact. Very precise measurements of various different cosmological observations are done now. 
So before that, this thing we now know kind of that the standard model uh, of cosmology is something which can be relied on. According to this, we are uh, this, the universe started with a highly dense and I high, uh, very hot state, small state too, and small in size also, and uh, evolved. As it evolved, it cooled, it expanded and cooled, and then as it cooled, actually, matter particles were created, okay, in the form of whatever we said, the standard model particles, say, and then structures were formed, like first as it cooled again. Then these new these particles could actually come together to form the protons and neutrons, and then the protons and neutrons came together to form uh, nucleons for the light uh, elements. And then, and uh, sometime, then these electrons bound to the nucleon, uh, the, the, the nucleate to form the atoms, and then the story goes on, and then finally we have the structure that we see now. So that is the that's the kind of evolution of the universe that we think is the way that it has come through, and um, so in that in that the whole dynamics of the whole structure of the universe therefore has uh, relied on the particle interaction certainly, and at the moment we have very good understanding of uh, the elementary particles, terrestrial or through terrestrial experiments, and. Uh, that when we put in 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 the in the um, cosmological context, we should be able to actually get all the structures we think here. Yeah. It's not easy from the particle physics point of view to actually build and then get the structures so to, to 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 the level that we want. But that's that's a kind of thing that we expect would have happened. Although we don't really know how to get it to get from this to the galaxies easily. That's a different kind of um, a, a different area of study altogether. So just to we are going to a little more details of uh, the evolution of the universe, including the time uh, scales, which most of you may be familiar with. So this is the scale at which we know the particle dynamics very, very well. That is the scale at which that the corresponding energy scale at which we are now experimenting with the particle physics uh, experiments like the Large Hadron Collider that you, some of you may have heard about, which collides the protons and protons and then so trying to understand uh, experimentally uh, what are the properties of the particle dynamics at that level. This is the time scales and in terms of energy, it is 100 to uh, 1 TeV, 100 GeV to 1 TeV, 100 to 1000 GeV. Then uh, all these things, as I said, uh, happens and then it cools down and then more, more structures are formed and the nucleons are formed within the first uh, few minutes, like uh, about 200 seconds or something like that, it's formed, the lithium and the nuclear formation, the Big Bang nucleosynthesis kind of closed at that time. Further on, but from there to here, it does a long time you can see that these are in seconds and then uh, this is in years now. So it is 400,000 years in the evolution of the universe is when atoms were formed. That's a very, very important uh, epoch actually. It's important for our discussion today as well. So this, what happened the that time is uh, something which uh, uh, is known as the cosmic microwave background radiation. So this, I'll come to what exactly that means, but what happens essentially is that photons in the universe started free streaming. Okay, photons free stream in the sense that they don't really interact with uh, other things, and that we can observe now. Those relic photons, which comes from so uh, far or in the early from the early universe in this epoch. Is still moving around, and then we can detect them, and then we have detected those, and that gives a lot of information, including that for the dark matter aspect. So that's the story that we have, and then uh, for the uh, missing links that we have in the standard model, we have say 
we don't know what makes uh, how to get the small neutrino mass that we now have established. The neutrino, uh, very, very small mass, but it is not zero. It is important that it is not zero. And that is not explained in the standard model. And then there is this dark matter, which uh, I will come to how exactly we established that there is dark matter. And uh, we don't know anything about the dark matter in this thing. In all that list of things that I have uh, shown you, we don't have a particle which will fit into this dark matter thing. And there are other uh, difficulties out there. So it's not that the standard model is there, fix this, this and we know everything about particle dynamics. There are a lot of things that we know about the thing, and then almost, I mean, many things are established, but there are things that are still missing. So, particularly for our this evening's discussion, it is important that uh, we have we don't have any such candidate in the standard model of particle physics so far. So, what is the CMPR? Let me just quickly uh, go through that. And um, uh, as I said, uh, from the plasma of ions and electrons to the uh, atoms, there was some time, but it, eventually the atoms were formed. So when you are in the plasma, the photons were high, high, so kind of trapped there in the sense that they will be, that will be highly interacting with the plasma. So you cannot actually see the free photons on that. It is highly interacting with that thing. It is kind of trapped and scatters with various different charged particles in the plasma. But once the atoms are formed, atoms are neutral, electrically neutral, so it will have some kind of a residual, small, feeble, very feeble interaction with the photons. But basically, for all practical purposes, you can think that uh, the photons are free. The electromagnetic field, if you put atoms in that, nothing much happens. There may be some quarter fold interactions, etc. But uh, but you don't really have strong electromagnetic interactions. In there. So the photons can actually just pass through the uh, neutral atomic. Uh, atom gas kind of thing. So that's what happens. The universe, in a sense, became transparent compared to the previous stage of this plasma. From then on, there is nothing to actually absorb this photon, nothing to interact with. We don't have any. It was just freely moving, wandering photons, and that's basically what is the cosmic microwave background radiation. This was recognized as one of the main signatures of standard cosmology, Big Bang cosmology. Cosmic microwave background radiation should be there in such a scenario. I'm telling this now because now we kind of accept almost as a fact that uh, Big Bang cosmology is the story of the universe, but it was not the case um, 40 years ago and or before that. And there were ordinary theories, there were a lot of skepticism, and there are many people who did not really believe in such a thing, etc. So that time people wanted uh, the signatures for that, experimental proofs for things. That's what we look for in physics. We want confirmations and experimental proofs, theoretical. But so this was one of the this is one of the very important these things. And the very interesting fact is that. The cosmic microwave background radiation was discovered in a very accidental way. The people who were working for the Bell Labs, they uh, were doing something else to remove the background, and the background was very much there, whatever they tried. And there was some constant background to after removing everything, every non background, etc., of the photon. Okay? Uh, photons mean electromagnetic waves, electromagnetic spectrum. So there are certain wavelengths that is still remaining there that the uniform this thing constantly there and that they finally discussed with other scientists also and then uh, who were working in cosmology and were trying then to actually detect the cosmic microwave background radiation but these people already stumbled on it and then got it but they discussed it and then finally they got the paper out and then the Nobel prize so that was the discovery of this one. But the other work, the scientific work was going on, and the Kobe satellite was actually sent up, and then 
got the data and then so that it is uh, it the radiation can be considered as kind of as it coming from the black hole kind of a black body radiation with the temperature around 2.78 kelvin good and it is smooth uh, like that but at the same time even uh, from the kobe itself it was recognized that it's not that see when if it is a cosmic or of cosmic origin like what we are talking about then it should not matter whether i look in this direction or that direction or that direction or whether i am looking at from here or in gravity or in space or in some other corner of the universe it should be isotropic and it should be homogeneous that is what is expected okay that's what the cosmic cosmic picture is based on also but uh, what what they found is by and large it is true but there are some small anisotropies there and incidentally there were also other things which are working on it they really got same kind of picture of course because that is the true picture and uh, they just uh, missed the uh, bus uh, and this anisotropies uh, is one of the things that is very important for us there were other missions in the w map and planck is the latest and then their data was more precise and then the anisotropies were visible so from here the basically you can think about the red and blue as the difference in the temperature okay it's highly exaggerated the actual difference in the temperature is basically at the level of 10 to minus 5 okay so it's very small but to see that clearly it's exaggerated so this is a thought of. Now, if the universe was highly, very smooth, homogeneous and isotropic, exactly in the way that we were talking about, then where did all these structures? When we actually look around, we don't see this homogeneity and isotropy. When I look at this structure here, uh, or uh, from here and in Guwahati, it's different. Or when I look at the solar system, and then if I go out of the solar system and then look at something else, locally that's different. But at large scales, it is uniform. Locally, there are small, small structures, differences in the density, matter density, okay, or energy density. And that, in terms of temperature, it is the temperature difference in the temperature. So locally, or in the small regions, there are fluctuations by a large, at large scale. It is uniform. Whether you are looking at it here, it looks the same. It looks the same in this direction. So that is the kind of thing that we can actually have. And these fluctuations of the small scale, small differences and isotropies could be the seed of all these structures, uh, galactic structures and everything else. That could be the basically because of these fluctuations and that's what we think now. So understanding these fluctuations is important. It's uh, yeah. So why is that? That's so. As I said, this is what happened for when we talk about the uh, CMBR. But before it was pre-streaming, it was actually interacting with all. So this anisotropy should be coming from fluctuations in the interactions here, right? Some small perturbations there should be actually. Uh, so let us say this is the kind of the different parts of the universe. Then if there is some difference here compared to here, you should be able to see that in the photon spectrum in a sense. So that is what we, we mean when we say that the seed of all these uh, large scale structures could be there in the matter, the, the distribute the disturbances here or the perturbations here, which would put a signature in the CMBR. So understanding the CMBR is an important thing to understand the structure of the universe, density of the universe, and many other things, including the dark matter. So this is a bit of a technical uh, details, but you don't worry if you don't like that. Uh, I will tell you where you should put your spot right on. So basically, this any 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 function you know can be actually expanded in terms of some orthogonal functions. That's what happens here. Anyway, what happens is that you can actually look at that as what's called the power spectrum analysis. 
you don't know what it is, it doesn't matter. Uh, powers, uh, power spectrum analysis, but finally tells us that from various different things that the total energy of the universe, when we analyze it, we can actually think about it in terms of the matter, which means that particles which have mass, etc., and other forms of energies, and even including the radiation here. So this uh, that matter, sorry, the visible spectrum, visible mass, okay, which is basically the thing that the mass which will be relevant to the observation that we are making. How do we see things? We see things from light uh, coming from galaxies and stars and things like that. And those things are things that will interact with electromagnetically and uh, basically which what we call the baryonic matter. That constitutes only 5% of the total. Then there is some 37% uh, is still uh, massive particles, massive forms of energy. So it is matter, it's called matter. It is matter, but it is not giving out any light. We don't see that. It's not a barrier, it's not something which we see, which we observe. So the observable, observed universe that, that we have, observable universe that we, we see so far, is only 5% of the whole thing. And 27% of the rest of the energy uh, of this one, is or the total energy of this one is a dark part uh, is dark matter. We don't know, but it is some gravitating matter which also forms structures, which also take part in the structure formation, etc. And that's one of the things. So this clearly quantifies that and then tells categorically that the things are there. So this is the one place where we can actually uh, say that this much of dark matter. It's not just a qualitatively saying that it is possible that it is dark matter may be there. It is categorically actually quantifying the same thing. Compared to the observed uh, things, we can actually have, have we have a much larger matter in the universe, and that's what is the, called the dark matter. Okay. I'll tell you other ways, other other things that will also tell us about the um, uh, how dark matter can be established in other ways as well. Okay, so the other thing, uh, there's some rest of the energy is for the dark energy, but in, I'll not get into that. Uh, we can discuss that if somebody is interested outside this one, but that's called dark energy for various reasons. So now, uh, so let's get into this dark matter thing. So this is what I said, and now other ways of establishing this. This happened actually much, much, much earlier. Like in 1939 itself, observations, observations of um, um, galaxies. So the, specifically the rotation speed of stars in the galaxy. The galaxy rotates. You can find out that it rotates by looking at the stars in that. So if it, something is rotating, one end will be going away from you, the other end will be coming towards you. So one is redshifted. In terms of this one, which means that as it goes away, the wavelength will go closer to the red the wavelength, and when it is coming towards you, it will become darker and it will blue shape, it will come uh, closer to the blue. This one. So, from that, you know that things can things are rotating, that's basically the way that you see, and you can also find out the speed of rotation, the speed of this particles that move in that. So galactic rotation curve of the galaxy. So the galaxy, let us say, is rotating like this, which means that the stars in this are rotating this like this. That's what we mean. And if you look at the stars away from here, okay, you can actually identify how it rotates. So you can actually see what is the rotation speed of stars here, typically here, 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 right, as you go from the center outwards. That's what this line, this data points actually shows, okay? So this is basically the one that we have observed. Now, is that expected? That's what we expect or is there some problem with that? There is something which I see here, right, right here as the expected. What does that mean? So 
basically, if we see, if we assume that uh, the galaxy is like the normally what we expect, that the profile is like with uh, matter uh, density is large in the center, and as you go away from it, it uh, comes more and more. And finally, it plus I mean, it, 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 there is no more no more star away from it. So it's expected that the most of the particles are here, mass is concentrated here, and then as you go away from this one, at some point you can actually neglect the mass over here. So all these things will be affected by the mass that you have gravitationally, the mass that you have here. You can based on the gravity the Newtonian relation, the you can see that the velocity, okay, this is the centripetal uh, force compared to this one, and then see that it is basically velocity uh, is proportional to 1 over r. This is constant. If you say that m galaxy, which is that all the mass is inside that thing, then it is proportional to 1 over r. That's why you expect it to go down as you go away. If you go away, it will fall. But that's not seen. What is seen is actually not that it is falling, but it is slowly increasing in fact. So that's one place where people actually expected that maybe beyond what we see here, there's more matter, and that matter may be more uniformly spread out in these regions. If that is so, you will actually have a relation. This mass is not a constant here, but it will go like this, constant density and volume that you're considering. And that will immediately tell you that V is not falling down with this thing, but it can actually slowly rise like that. So that's one indirect way of seeing that. There is something which we don't see, and people have already been saying that, that the dark matter is visible. There are other explanations people have, you know, we don't really perceive. We, don't, we shouldn't, we should question and then say that is there any other way of doing it? There are other ways of modifying the gravity relation itself, we can't rely on this thing. Okay, fine. And then modify it to get this one. That's possible. But the problem is what you can do that here, but there were other observations as well. Lensing effect. And lensing effect is saying that um, basically this is uh, Einstein told us that the photons can be uh, affected by the gravity, strong gravitational field. So if we are seeing a galaxy from one end and then oh, one, uh, then we from Earth, if this was not there, then we will see it in as a point, straight line point here. But if there is some supermassive thing here in between, in the same uh, line of sight, then it will actually act like a lens, like optical lens. So here it will be a gravitating one. So this will actually bend the light which is coming from this. the photons which otherwise would be going straight would bend and come here which will happen all around it therefore we will see a round halo rather than a point okay. so here is a kind of a, a one of such example this is uh, i think partly computer simulated with the, um, the false coloring so basically it says that the one some galaxy in the background which is considered in, in the blue color here is seen not as a point, will not be seen as a point, but as a as a halo or a circle here. When this one is there, this one is a massive thing which gravitates or uh, bends the light here. The point is that this, how much, what is the size of this ring will depend on what's the mass of this. And you can actually estimate the uh, visible mass and in many different situations, that's not sufficient to explain the radius of this. And that's another indication of more mass than the visible mass. Okay. All right. So, and there are also other things. I'm because of say lack of time. Uh, I'm not explaining. I'm giving you all the details of the observations as well. Uh, there are various different ways. Therefore, we have actually now established that. There is that much yeah, in the universe. Matter that we don't see. Not there is nothing more strange about it than that. It is not anything 
in a dark holes in a in a in a in a in a other sense. But it's basically that something which you can't see. We that's not really how electromagnetic is right. So what does the particle physics say about this thing? We said in the beginning that we want to see that everything starts with these elementary particles and, and build with that. So how do we do that? We have to see that what are the properties of these particles, then we can actually try to address that problem. One, we know we have been saying that it doesn't have electromagnetic interaction. They should be massive because they also form structures, etc. And they should be weakly interacting because we don't if it is strongly interacting, it would actually be seen in various different forms of the race. Meaning it should be should be able to generate some of those things in the Particle colliders and other things. Anyway, it's just weakly interacting is uh, one of the things. So then, uh, do we first question that we ask is among the list of things that we have, is there anything that will fit to that? There's one particle which is electrically neutral, do not take part in electromagnetic interaction, and weakly interacting, and massive, which is the neutrino. But the neutrino, did I say the ah, neutrinos? Neutrinos fit to that description, but one problem that neutrinos mass it is so light that we have difficulty in getting the galactic structures or whatever the galactic profile that we need for the dark matter with neutrinos alone. So we can't have such light dark matter. So such light dark uh, particles. Or that matter okay, as for hot that matter, hot because they move with larger velocity and with therefore with larger energy. And uh, what we need is now we know that we need cold that matter, much more massive that matter. Okay, so um, typically we actually consider the spin zero particles as the simplest thing. So one thing is very clear so by now, we can't live with whatever we already know in the standard model. So we need additional particles. So we have to actually introduce new particles for this. Like we introduced the Higgs boson, which was not needed except to generate mass for it. So here we have to introduce a new spectrum, new particles, not for any other reason, but to explain the dark matter. So that is something very clear from the past particle physics point of view. Okay. I'm telling again sometimes in between particle physics point of view because there are other points of view in the scientific community which are still viable in various different but um, in various different ways most of them have one difficulty or the other in explaining something or the other and you have to be consistent with not one thing but many things. So that's one of the problems with many other scenarios. Uh, so, so, but we will be actually focusing on this part. So even if I don't say anything, I'll be actually talking only about this particular point of view. So from here, there is the, there is something called the weakly. So we, we generically we can call this part. We call these particles are weakly interacting massive particles. This was something which people have been talking about for many decades already. And um, second question now we ask is now suppose we introduce such a thing. Is there a consistent way, viable way of actually getting every experimental result that we every all the properties, all the things that we know? Like this 27 percentage, we have to calculate various things and then get this 27 percentage without disturbing anything else. We can't disturb the present experimental results. In the large quadrant collider or any other experiments, personally, in the cosmological context, also we should not be disturbing any other thing, like for example, the nuclear resistance of the structure formation and other these things without disturbing that, and um, all other dynamics respected, we should be able to get uh, the relic density. It's called a relic density because it is a relic of the early. Evolution of the universe. And it, it, it's something which has been there from the early universe. Uh, there, what remains after whatever dynamics happen at that time. 
So that is the relic density. So we have to get that relic density. And we should, second thing we can ask is, for example, we said that most of these galaxies have, apart from the visible thing, also dark matter. We, our galaxy should also be having that. You see, the dark matter profile of the galaxy should be one up. And if so, for the one our galaxy, we should be moving through that. Of course, it is weakly interacting, so we don't really feel it uh, usually, but we should be able to detect it perhaps. So that's also done. So there is a direct detection experiments which are proposed and then being conducted. And then there are future more precise proposed uh, experiments being proposed as. So that's not happening. Well, what happens in that is actually the I'll come to. But basically, that's these two things. And then one more thing that can happen is that uh, indirect. How do you mean to indirectly? Well, these particles can actually come, as we said, particles can come together and annihilate, okay, and then go away, releasing some other uh, form of energy or other particles. So, for example, in the galactic centers, there are a lot large concentration of this dark matter. They can annihilate and then produce photons. We should be able to detect that. But it is not just those photons which are coming. So we can we have to see if there is excess of photons, more photons than expected otherwise. So this, this is being done. So that is an indirect detection. It could be from something else also, but it could be from that matter. So there are uh, experiments, indirect experiments, which is basically uh, mostly space-based experiment, but also are still recently, but essentially uh, that's another thing. So that's what is basically given in this cartoon, uh, like uh, which way does the reaction go for each of these. So uh, that's only for those who can easily decide for it, otherwise we that thing. But basically we have direct detection experiments, relic density thing which is not given here, indirect detection, and you should be able to also produce after all, they were produced in the early universe. So here we are recreating that mostly in the peak proton proton creations at, la, at the LHC. We should be also able to produce this dark matter. We should be, should be looking for that. This is also done. So, so far, results are all negative. We have not seen any indication of dark matter, direct detection of any, any such thing. Nothing at the large scatter collider also. And nothing in the uh, indirect detection also. Direct detection experiments are like this, mostly. So what it does is actually prepare some kind of a detector, which is a large volume detector, because whenever you have very fixed, small probability for something to happen, then you actually rely on the volume. You put more things there, and then you may get one or two. And that's what happens. That's a similar thing that happens in the neutrinos uh, experiments as well. So here, therefore, you have a thing. So what happens is that if you are passing through this, you prepare some kind of a very uh, uh, heavy nucleus. Xenon is one of the things that you use. And that nucleus, when the dark matter hits that, okay, it can scatter off and exchanging some momentum. So there will be a recoil of that. This recoil, what happens that recoil energy, because it is in that medium, that nucleus is in that medium, it will release that energy by interacting with these other things in the medium. And then finally, you will have uh, photons. And then photon detect electrons will come and then ionize and then the, it will actually leave out the photons and then photons will be detected. That is what is the basically the kind of idea there in the direct detection experience. So you have just if you are passing through this arrow of the dark matter, you may be able to see this. Uh, there are many different experiments that is already performed. You can see these things that are and expected also I mean future experiments as well. What you can say is when you don't see something is that we, if such a thing was there, I mean, 
It depends also on what the mass of that thing is and how much they interact with this. So, if it was of, say, 10 GeV mass, and if its interaction strength is such that the cross section, that cross section for this scattering, is of this something like 10 power minus 42 in these units, centimeters per, if that is so, then we would have seen that. Since we don't see that, it should be smaller than that. That is what we can say. We cannot say that it's not there at all. So far, I have not seen that or not. We are not seeing, therefore, it is not smaller than that. So that is what we see. Or we, we, these are the limits that they put there. So we have set some limits so far, and we will put more limits in the future. This one. So these are the kind of things. This also, I should tell you that it also depends on what kind of dark matter that we are talking about. This is specific to what's called, what we have been talking about as the weakly interacting massive particles. There could also be other kind of things. One which is not going to uh, be constrained by such a direct interaction. Like there are other ways which are more fashionable and more interesting in recent times called feebly interacting dark matter for those who are about it, which means that it is even more weakly Okay, I think I was five minutes or something. And um, so this uh, is, these are the kind of thing that we set the limits on this one. And so far we don't have anything there. Then uh, we can actually talk about the direct so the, the production at the Large Hadron Collider, then again, the dark matter accessory is missing. I mean, it, it doesn't interact with anything. So what do you mean by producing it, but don't see it? So what we have to look for is processes or react, uh, things that we will, I mean, whenever this thing happens, there would be some reactions where dark matter is produced. Along with that, there may be some photons or something else also in the same process. In that case, you can look for that photon or electron or whatever something, and that uh, and the properties of that, uh, the energy balancing and things like that, and then say that okay, something is missing. Very similar to the beta decay. Remember, we detected, we discovered, or the missing particle there. Neutrino was missing, not detected in the beta decay. Very similar to that here last time. Uh, yeah, so by and large, that is the kind of thing that is happening. And then there are other details, other experiments, like uh, indirect experiments, etc. So let me conclude uh, without going into the details of those things. So uh, basically, we have this dark matter, uh, which uh, is clearly established now. There are a lot of development in this. Uh, understanding of that. Uh, we know certain things and we know certain things don't work and we know certain things could still be possibly work, etc. But there are a lot of things that we still have to know, understand and theoretically as well as uh, experimentally to establish any particle physics candidate for the that particle. Okay, so let me stop here and maybe if you have specific questions. So now we can take some good questions. Thank you for the presentation. So this large uh, hydrogen collider, it, it produces this uh, dark matter yeah. and it is not detected yet. So what is that invisible thing? Um, so and yeah, it's saying that. I mean, this is a cartoon. This is not a. It's saying that if the invisible particles go away, there will be this missing momentum. So what you do basically is you can detect the momentum of this particle, and you know for momentum balance, the initial momentum balance uh, is the same as the final momentum. And therefore, you can say that if this has to be balanced by something else. So that is called the missing Here it is also set transverse number two, but it is basically because 
you cannot say anything about the longitudinal momentum because it is a proton. Actually, it is the quark with inside the proton which is interacting. So you can't say anything about the mean and the longitude and that, that means that direction. So only the transverse direction momentum balancing will tell you that something is missing. It could be any error. This is one possibility. No, you cannot because um, if you detect it goes this way. Suppose you find a missing something beyond the standard model or something which we have not understood is there. One possible candidate or one possible situation is that it is a dark matter. It is dark matter. It could be something else also. Somebody can come up with that. Itself. But that should be that would be a for no other reason something is there and that should be fitting in with everything else as well. Yeah. Yeah. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? What are you talking Antimatter universe, maybe all these antimatter is going to another yeah. place, and is that what's that really here in this? Yeah, that's basically another story. I uh, it is not really connected to the dark matter. So what happens is same picture. Actually, this is things the CMB spectrum actually tells a lot more about that dark matter also. I said the particles are annihilated in pairs of particle and antiparticle and created in pairs of particle and antiparticle. Electrons always are created along with positrons. But now when you look around, everything is made of electrons, not positrons. Positrons are there, some very small, very, very scanty uh, in the cosmic rays or you can create in the lab itself. The density is very, very negligible. What happened to all those positrons if the standard model is static, which were produced in the beginning? So we can say that I mean, as it goes, it's actually not annihilated and involved. But when an electron, a, a positron is annihilated, an electron would also be annihilated. So if everything was like exactly balanced like this thing, symmetric, then it wouldn't be positive. So this is a be another question. Similarly for the quarks, protons, and other distance also. So that's known as the baryon asymmetry of the universe, the matter antimatter asymmetry of the universe. In the visible universe that we see, we only have matter. We don't have any antimatter. So one conclusion, one possibility is what you said. There could be multiple possibility that maybe in some kind of the way that the antimatter is in another corner. And in it has other structures which we don't see. It is causally disconnected, therefore, we can't see any light coming from that or any communication from that. That's a possibility, but a more uh, uh, feasible thing from other aspects is that there could be slight asymmetries in what we are talking about in the dynamics. And what we need is a very, very small asymmetry in the whole thing, which could actually. Uh, give rise to all these problems. But that problem is still not solved. It is another problem like the dark matter, baryon asymmetry of the universe. How to generate this baryon asymmetry? So, this uh, dark matter is formed using uh, uh, this uh, when exactly the evolutionary process of the universe, exactly when this dark matter is formed. Yeah. So the dark matter should be there as a, along with all other particles, even before the nucleosynthesis, along with the quarks and other things in that. But then, as it in the dim scenario, so what happens is as it, as it evolves, they will actually uh, interact, annihilate, and then go into other particles. So the initially they could be in equilibrium, and then they deviate from the equilibrium around the time when the temperature of the universe is similar to or in the same scale as that of mass of So there will be an equilibrium will be disturbed. So there will be 
and uh, uh, from all these observations and other behaviors. But uh, so that's not a uniform distribution. It's also falling according to the transfer space. But you are right. It should also be consistent with the other one. So it will be bigger, I think, bigger spreading out more compared to the big principle. And then the densities are sufficient enough. And it is also not really proportional to that. Because the observation is also not proportional to R. It is more closer to the state in the constant. Sir, sir, uh, I have a very really lay person's question. Yes, Mentioned uh, in uh, different temperature. So, does uh, climate change have any effect on, let's say, particle structure and basic structure and embryonic? Yeah. Does that have any like, climate change? Climate change. Would, have, would it have any effect on, let's say, a particle structure and the percentage of dark matter and other things? I'm just wondering. Or, or this. No? Yeah. Well, first of all, it is on phase based experiment. Double telescope or plant phase mission is in the phase. So that will not be affected by the atmosphere or such. So any other effect on the terrestrial experiments also, usually what they, they do is to actually take, there are a lot of backgrounds. For example, in this, this is after filtering all the backgrounds and removing it. So if there is such effects, then that will also be considered as an eliminator. When you are doing a terrestrial experiment, mm -hmm. you are right if you are doing it for, um, for some tens of years or some a number of years, some of these things can perhaps be there, but those effects can be actually calculated, known, and therefore detected. That becomes the background. Here, for example, when we know the galaxies, photons come from galaxies also. So the galactic sources and any other distance, that is all taken away. That's considered as the background. So this is after removing the background. So therefore, such effects are not there here. All such non effects are all taken care of. Well, I mean, most of the time, what happens is that these are a few years. So really, not Yes. Yeah. You mentioned the percentages. Yeah. 5%, 27%. Yes. So how do you know 100%? Huh. What is it? That's, I, I, yes, you are right. That's a very interesting point. I have put this here. I didn't want to go into the details. Uh, so, because of the lack of time, firstly. So, this first peak, your position of this first peak, actually, there, this first peak, information about this thing, the amplitude of this one, itself, tells us that the density. Total energy density is close to the critical density for a large universe. So that's what we know. And that can be calculated. What is the, what is the energy? This one is needed, RC needed for the flat universe, the universe which is flat universe. Is needed. So that part comes from this first peak. That doesn't tell anything else. This first peak. It doesn't tell anything else but the total energy density. It is sensitive to that. The second peak, in fact, and in fact, the difference between the first peak and the second peak tells about the observed the matter that interacts with the photons in the plasma. So that is what we call the periodicity, and that is where this five percent comes. Then the slope, the dampening of this. This is basically an acoustic fluid model. I mean, consider the plasma as a fluid and acoustic waves in that or uh, acoustic modes in that. That is what happened. And then the dampening of that, this is sensitive to the total matter, total gravitating matter, which is 32 percent. 32 minus 5 is 27 percent. That's how you get the 27 percent. So the total thing is coming from that. And that is why we said that the rest of it is. What is the situation in this simplest model like energy density? It is highly constrained. Uh, highly constrained. constrained, constrained. The problem is this coupling, this interaction here, 
is exactly the same insert folder that comes in the annihilation of the bat matter to get the right relic density. This being small because of because we don't see that, we don't get the, the right relic density in the matter. It becomes smaller. The simple models are very Almost, excepting for some small this thing, you can have mass close to the fixed mass. mass. Yeah, it's very so much like you. But you can have multiple dark matter. That's why we can have. We can have it. Yeah, that's all. But if wind is not ruled out in that, right? So, any other questions? I think I have a question for you. The last physics class that I attended was from. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm really sorry for this question. If, if this, Not uh, Any question so, so the thing is that I was dropping my son to school yeah. and we live in Bangalore. I'm from Delhi College. Okay. And then uh, he told me that uh, the same thing 5, 23, and 68 percent is what he told me. Yeah. 27 percent. He gets another He told me that and then uh, he asked me something like, what is uh, dark matter and what is dark okay. energy? And that's why we are here. Well, thank so you. we don't know, we yeah. don't know. Uh, so what I assumed after the whole lecture of your sir is that uh, what is acceptable or what is we know in physics is the first matter and what we don't understand of the physics is dark matter. Am I right, sir? In a sense that, well, uh, okay, let me just maybe after a minute yes, I'll yes, tell you. Yes. Yeah. And also the yeah. dark energy, what is dark yeah, energy? Yeah, I have to know how to think about that. <laughs> okay, firstly, dark matter from the point of view, uh, what is the difference, the physical or other things? I exist very much physical. There is no other strange behavior of that. Okay, there is nothing strange about it as far as the physics is concerned. For example, if there was, uh, there is a um, gravitational dark matter uh, in our galaxy, which will have the gravitational attraction, everything exactly similar to any other thing like Earth or Sun or anything else. There is no other difference. Difference is that they do not have electromagnetic interaction. Whatever, they are not charged, electrically charged. So only electrically charged particles can actually interact with, like electrons. Electron is negatively charged, and we have electricity and atoms shine. That is because electrons in the atom uh, interact with the protons in the atom, and that is how we, we, we get all these lines everywhere. And in the stars, same thing happens. There are also nuclear reactions where photons come out, and that is what we observe. In fact, that's the only thing we can observe. Whenever we see we look at a galaxy, we take our telescope and then direct to that. We receive the photos, lights, and x rays, gamma rays, and other things. That is what we see. That's all we can, that is our window of seeing these things. What we are only saying is that whatever we see is only perception. Rest of it is like I told you about neutrinos. Neutrinos is very much. I mean, now familiar to many of us, and uh, the neutrinos do not have this much. We can't see that. In fact, millions of neutrinos are right now passing through, passing through us, through the Earth also. And it does not interact much with the Earth, it just passes through. There is no small interaction, but which is what we call the weak interaction. Apart from that, it just passes through. It's transparent. It is like taking a glass would shine on it. It passes through. Neutrinos pass through my hand exactly the same. Like, you know, X-rays pass through, but the bonds are dense enough to obstruct that. Flush is not. Similarly, neutrinos, even concrete, is like flush for X. Dark matter is not exactly like that, but somewhat similar to that. It also passes through us. It can actually go exactly the same way without any interaction. Light is blocked because it interacts with it. It is absorbed. It is interacting with itself. Most no, no dark matter do not interact with passes. So that is the only strange behavior of dark matter. Okay, it took more than half a minute. <laughs> but 
for the dark energy. Dark energy is again nothing mysterious. Mysterious, of course, but in a physical scientific way. But nothing about the dark force or any other thing. Okay. So it is again dark because uh, I don't know why dark energy is called dark, but basically the behavior is like this. Recently we have observed that see the universe is at its expanding. Now it is not expanding, and we can actually, like she said, the redshift uh, of things. That's what we see. We see that stars are redshifted. We can actually affect what is redshift. It's, it's, I mean, like when we observe that this thing, the spectrum that we observe, the light we observe, we can deduce from that that they are moving away from us. And if they are coming towards us, it is blue shift. So the red shifted things will tell us that it is moving away from us. And we can in fact find out how much, what is the speed at which it is moving. And this moving away is basically uh, whether it is moving at a constant speed or is it moving at a speed which is kept reducing or kept increasing. Recently we have seen, recently in five, ten years, we have seen observationally that they are moving away from us at an increasing speed. It's an accelerated expansion of the universe. So the universe is not only just expanding, which we know very well, it is also expanding at an accelerated rate. This accelerated rate, sorry. This accelerated expansion of the universe is something which can happen if we have energy which does not behave similar to what we know, the usual energy, but which has a negative pressure. I mean, the energy pressure, etc. physically we can actually relate to each other, but it actually pushes things out, like not the gravitating thing. It actually pushes this, therefore it actually moves faster and faster in a, in a very heuristic way. That is what happens in this case. So this energy, this much of energy in the universe is kind of causing that. That is basically the dark energy. And I'm not sure why they call the dark energy. I think it's a bit of a misnomer. Of course, dark matter, it makes sense, but dark energy is a bit of a misnomer. What is it? Yeah. But actually it's transparent. Yeah. So that's the only reason. There is no other connotation. <laughs> okay. Yes, we are passing through. We are passing through it. Is <laughs> oh, there that is passing through. <laughs> it depends. It's related. We have given the example of Britain. Britain are partial. So that can also be dark matter. Okay. Although it is the constraint, it is uh, yeah, so right. Sure. In fact, dark matter could have I mean, not, not could have been a dark matter candidate. The only problem is that it does not fit well with various density profile of the uh, galaxies, etc. Again, uh, out of curiosity, I'm also a biologist. Yeah. Okay. Last time I studied physics in first <laughs> What is the significance of this universe? The presence or absence of it, how it is going to affect us or anything? Ah. Uh, it may not affect us at all, but it's just first thing is the intellectual curiosity to know what's going on, what's the universe, and things like that. I mean, that's one of the parts. Um, but one of the things that happens is like the solar system. You want to understand the solar system, in, that, that's where a lot of neutrinos come from. So these neutrinos uh, are like. Um, coming from the nuclear reactions of the sun. So it does have certain thing to say about the nuclear reactions in the in the stars and other other Indian star and that. So maybe in a way that to understand that and things like that, it will be important to see what neutrinos for neutral dynamics better. Ultimately it is the understanding of yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. that, we don't really don't have the neutrino, we may yeah. not have sun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we may not have sun. So, so, sun shines because of two nuclear reactions. Nuclear reactions, I mean, and, and 
Just for the information of people, we have a show in planetarium on dark matter, which covers some of the things in more popular way. So if you are interested, uh, next one is the planetarium. You can see the show timing there. I think this happens on Friday, Sunday. It comes on many days. You can just have it's a 20, 30 minute show. So just for everyone, maybe Sunday also. Yeah. Watch sure. if you are trying to make it come in. Sure. It's a from European Southern Observatory show. Uh -huh. We have procured it and we are showing it here. Okay, very good. Yeah. You should have written it a little more. In fact, I've been seeing that that, that part is, yeah, maybe. You yourself may not be able to do that, but tell other people. Sir, like the Marley ID, so we have other departments. Sure, sure. Sir, the physicists have uh, some understanding of soul and divinity. Okay. And yeah, I know. I mean, it's, 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 it's yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I, I, I tell you something. A little okay. bit about the physics part of that. Not, not really the physics part, but scientists' view on that. I mean, because I personally have some interest in that. <laughs> so, uh, uh, point is that we don't really have any idea about it. But if we do ask question about it, question that we ask, there are two levels. One is, what's life itself? Like, between, before the, see, when I say everything is made of these, you see, this question is very natural. When it comes to others, this thing is okay. Earth is made of the sun is made of that. That's fine. But we are also made of that. Now, materially speaking, between just a moment before and after my death. Well, yeah. Right. Materially, there shouldn't be any difference. You should be able to tell me more about how the circulation of the fluids would actually be taking part in that life itself. So life, what is life itself is not understood. But the question is there. Science cannot deny that. It's just that we are completely ignorant about that. Can't at the moment address that question. Nobody has a clue about it. Secondly, the second level of this thing is consciousness. Now that there are different living beings at different levels of consciousness. What causes that consciousness? There are a lot of scientific investigation which is going on where neuroscience, neuroscientists, doctors, medical practitioners, medical practitioners, as well as neuroscientists otherwise, and physicists are involved. I mean, it's not just any arbitrary research, just frontline researchers involved in that, okay? searching for consciousness. Dr. There's this Penrose who got double price in 20 for the black hole. Saying that black hole is a stable thing. Einstein's equation, general theory of relativity, gives a solution which is a stable object. Stable in the sense that there's, it's possible that something is possible, but it does not stay there for some time. Well, a black hole is not so. So Penrose has got a Nobel Prize for saying that, mathematically showing that it is a stable object. He had a lot of questions. He has been actually thinking about it and he's still alive and then he's still thinking about it. What causes consciousness now? He is also working on with various different levels of neuroscience, etc. So his idea or one of the things that emerges recently is quantum consciousness. Quantum consciousness tells us about, I mean something about uh, that it is perhaps the direction in which you might look at. That's all we can say now. He does not also have any it. kind of a very, very, um, very, very tendency thing to say, but that is a kind of thing. See, he's one of the best brains of our time, and then he is also suggesting such a thing. So, perhaps in the next 100 years, mm -hmm. after his such <laughs> you know, uh, we may have some clue about how to address that question. We don't really have a question. Also, it depends on how complex. Ah, it is. 
From an evolutionary point of view, I say like it depends on how complex started from the universe life forms and they have reached this level after so many billions of years. Uh, what's the I have read very little about it. Snake has got some level of consciousness, dog has got some five centers, human has something else, range. It will only get complex and complex, maybe. Yeah. Yes, sir. Actually, uh, why? Thank you. Thank you, sir. 